Do Hello, it, everyone, and welcome to NAB Day 2 here at the 3D Motion Show live in New York. I'm your host, Matthias Omatola, a.k.a. Major VFX on all the socials. I'm accompanied by one of the men, the myth, the legend, John Ooh. Lepore himself. Had many presentations over the years. Get ready for another too, rock star too presentation. Too many. Way too many. Uh, is, there, is there a limit? No. Yeah. And here's another great one. John Lepore, let's give him a big round of applause. Is everybody having fun here at NAB New York today? Yes, last day of the show. Let's finish it out strong. Uh, I hope everybody's having a good time. Uh, who here is from out of town? All right, yes. Well, I hope everybody enjoys their smelly time here in New York. Uh, I'm John Lepore. I'm really excited to be here just to geek out with y'all about one of my favorite software platforms that has been a huge part of my personal career over the last 15 years or so. Um, I love Cinema 4D as well as several of the other Maxon tools. Uh, these things have played such an important role in enabling me to have some really amazing experiences through my career. Um, I've had some recent changes. I've been for about the last 16 years or so uh, the principal and chief creative director at an amazing studio called Perception, based in New York, now in, in New Jersey. And I've recently started a new chapter going out on my own as a creative consultant who is designing the future for film, technology, and automotive. And so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what that means, what it is that I'm up to, the kind of work that I'm doing, and, and the way that I love using tools like Cinema 4D to wrap my head around how you can take advantage of really interesting three-dimensional space. So uh, first off, uh, this is kind of what I've been saying about myself. I'm a creative consultant who is designing the future. And I know that sounds kind of like BS. It sounds like super vague. It's kind of fluffy. Uh, you could argue that anybody is, you know, thinking about the future or are a futurist. But I, I truly believe that when I talk about this concept of designing the future, that I, I have a right to say that I'm, I'm uniquely qualified to do that. And what is it that puts me in a position where I get to say that uh, it, is, it is my focus and my specialty that I design the future. Well, for the last decade or so, I have spent all of my time alternating between these two worlds, these two pathways. I've spent about 50% of my time doing creative development for film, and I've spent the other 50% of my time doing design for next generation technologies. So let me explain a little more what this silliness is that I'm describing here. Uh, working in film, I've had amazing opportunities to work on some of the biggest movies ever made, some of which haven't even come out yet. And when working on these films, I'm focusing almost exclusively on this idea of developing what uh, the future of technology will be like in these fictional worlds where these stories take place. Uh, I think it's become a common trope nowadays that you watch a science fiction film or a superhero movie and there's futuristic gadgets and technology. I love contributing to these stories in these ways, but I try as hard as I can to push it beyond just being decorative wallpaper in the background of the story or just a bunch of glowing blue shit floating in the air at all times, but instead really try to approach it from this perspective of how will technology realistically evolve to these heightened realities that we see in fiction? And how can I present it and create it and design it in a way where it feels a little more plausible, a little more believable, and ultimately invites audiences to be a little more curious about the worlds where these stories take place. So I'm going to share with you uh, one of my favorite projects that I had ever contributed to the world of film. This is a montage of about 18 months worth of work that went into Marvel Studios' Black Panther. 
And this was an amazing opportunity to be presented, given this sort of focus and specialty, in that in the film Black Panther, the world of Wakanda has to have the most advanced technology ever depicted on film seen before. And so I really pushed my team at Perception to go beyond just the idea of glowing luminescent holograms floating in the air and instead pursue this concept that we described as vibranium sand, this actual physical substance that would levitate into the air and form different shapes in three dimensions. It's actually based on real world principles where you can use ultrasonic sound waves to levitate styrofoam particulate and other matter. And so we took this idea and extrapolated it out into this concept of vibranium sand that appeared in the film in a ton of different ways, including the way that Black Panther's suit would activate and surround him as he's jumping into battle. Uh, the director of the film, Ryan Coogler, one day approached us and said, we want to open the film with a Wakandan history lesson that tells you about the backstory of how the world of Wakanda was developed and came together, and that that should be entirely rendered in vibranium sand. One of the final pieces that we put together for the film was a closing title sequence, effectively a two minute music video that plays at the end of the film, celebrating the events of this story that was also set to a soundtrack made specifically for the title sequence by Kendrick Lamar. And we found different ways to pipe in Kendrick's actual song into our sand simulation so that they would levitate and undulate and bounce with the rhythm of the music while also creating these beautiful depictions of the the story that we had just concluded so a project like black panther again for me is the perfect example of the ways that i've had the opportunity to contribute to this idea of you know taking a more factual approach to how technology works in fiction now that's only been 50 percent of the kind of work that i have done in my career the other 50 percent has been working on real world technology products. And that's been in all sorts of fascinating spaces where I've got many clients who are constantly trying to figure out how can they take advantage of the newest and most exciting and interesting emerging technologies that are on the horizon. Uh, I've worked in all sorts of different niches uh, from augmented reality to artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles, uh, military grade cybersecurity and aerospace and, and whatnot. Um, one of these niche areas of real world technology that I'm particularly passionate about is the world of automotive. I'm a huge car geek. My old man is a racing instructor. And ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be a car designer. And I've been able to sort of fulfill those dreams by working with numerous automotive manufacturers in helping them develop the next generation of technology that will be appearing in their vehicles. There's so many different projects that I've done in this space and almost all of them are, are top secret or maybe a few years out, but there is one in particular that has been revealed to the world relatively recently and that is the brand new all electric Hummer EV that General Motors made. Starting probably about three years ago, I worked really closely with an amazing team at General Motors and also led the team at Perception developing this entire operating system of digital experience that you, that you use when you are operating this insane over-the-top vehicle. And you can already begin to sort of connect the dots, right? Like this vehicle actually starts to overlap a little bit with this work done in fiction. This is probably the most cinematic vehicle ever made. It is uh, very impactful, very dramatic, very exciting, and was able to leverage a lot of high fidelity techniques to put together interesting things like when the vehicle changes, uh, starts up, you get this beautiful welcome animation that plays out across the instrumentation. Uh, when you're doing any precarious off-roading with the vehicle, you get this three-dimensional gyroscope that lets you know how much the vehicle is pitching and rolling in any given direction. And so many of these ideas are founded in very serious user experience principles. When you work on a vehicle, you have to take human-centered design unbelievably seriously. If you are 
designing an interface just to be flashy or exciting or dramatic, the worst case in a the worst case scenario for a user in an automobile, if you can imagine, can be really, really bad. And so we base these concepts on some very serious user experience foundation, but also look for ways to really flex it and find these little cinematic flourishes that we can bring to the table in an experience like what we put together for GM's Hummer EV. So for me, bouncing back and forth between these two worlds has, for me, really developed and honed a very particular strength that I'm really proud of. For me, my strength has become, uh, you know, coming from a background as a designer, an animator, a 3D artist, a visual effects artist, now I'm finding myself being a rare individual who's very comfortable being in scenarios or being in contexts where we have projects, we have challenges that nobody quite understands and can make sense out of. We've got all these exciting emerging technologies that are coming at us so quickly, they can be overwhelming, right? Like we're all, everyone is scrambling to make sense of like, what is the metaverse? Uh, how do we really bring true autonomous vehicles to market? How does everything change when we're designing interfaces or experiences for spatial dimensional interactions in platform in platforms like VR and AR. There's all these different spaces that are converging for me that I'm really excited about. And I've had opportunities to get experience in each of these. And for me, one of the key things that helps me in this space and that I implore any other 3D artists or motion designers to really understand is that this discipline, being able to understand three-dimensional space, being able to understand animation, being able to understand design and information design means that for me, this discipline of motion design has a leg up on all of these emerging challenges that are going to be appearing in the landscape that's coming towards us in the years ahead. So if anyone at any point wants to geek out with me, just reach out because I can go on forever about ways that we can apply this amazing discipline of motion design to some of the biggest technology-based problems that are going to be coming at us in the near future. So I want to share something that is for me kind of like a typical process or that I will go through where I find myself with a challenge or an opportunity and I wanna bust open Cinema 4D and start sketching and experimenting and playing around. And so I thought it would be fun to explore the idea of designing a new or overhaul the interface or the, we call this the HMI, the human machine interface within a modern Porsche, but let's take it to another level. Like this is pretty familiar. We've got a, a dial gauge here in the instrument cluster. We've got a infotainment screen here. What if we wanted to take this much further and make something that felt uh, volumetric, that felt holographic, that felt like it had a much greater sense of depth and flexibility to it. So what I wanna do is do some sketching and some playing around and some experimenting in Cinema 4D to figure out how we can put something like this together. So the first thing that I'm going to experiment with is designing a instrument cluster. I think the concept of a instrument cluster should be familiar to everybody. It's usually a radial dial of, of some kind that you see numbers and information displayed across. So I'm starting here just with a circular spline and I've brought in from Adobe Illustrator some paths for what I call chaplets. Uh, chaplets is like a fancy way of saying tick marks. What I'm going to do is take these Illustrator elements and just really quickly extrude them here in Cinema 4D, which is gonna take these paths and turn them into geometry. So I have these physical chaplets now. I'm gonna bring their extrusion way down and what I want to do is have these going around this ring and this circle. And so the first thing I need is I need a lot more chaplets. So I am going to clone these. 
Um, I'm putting them into a cloner object. I'm going to set this object to linear. I'm going to set the axis on which it is cloning to the X axis. And I'm going to make a certain number of steps of these. Let's just see how this feels. So I've got a number of these here. And one of the things that I can do now is I've got this long row of these tick marks, these chaplets, but it doesn't feel anything like an instrument cluster or a, uh, let's say, tachometer. In a sports car, this, this Porsche, coolest instrument is going to be the tachometer that tells you the speed of the engine at all times. And I want to create something that's going to capture that feel. So what I'm going to do is use my single favorite tool in Cinema 4D, which is called Spline Wrap. I'm going to use lots and lots of spline wrap in the next 20 minutes because it is like, it is my favorite thing in all of Cinema 4D. So what I do is I'm putting my cloner of the chaplets alongside the spline wrap deformer under a null. Anything that is alongside this null uh, or alongside the spline wrap deformer within this null will take on the properties of spline wrap. I'm going to drop this circular spline into the spline wrap controls and already you can see I now have those chaplets going in a circular orientation around this dial form that I'd created. Now it's it's not quite it feels more like like a mechanical gear than a tachometer or maybe even say the face of a wristwatch. So within the spline wrap tool I'm going to go into this rotation parameter and adjust the banking. And in here I can just turn this banking to a negative 90 degrees, and now we instantly have something that feels much more traditional to a tachometer. Now that I'm seeing it here, I'm deciding that, you know what, my extrusion may be still a little too deep, so let's make this uh, a little more shallow. I'm just going to put this to two. Uh, maybe we could do, let's try four, see how that looks. And looking at this, I can now say, you know what, we could take this and maybe because we're going to make a properly holographic tachometer for this car, maybe I can play with this banking a little bit so that there's just like a little bit of depth. Like I like it being concave to me, that feels a little more cool or a little more interesting than maybe the traditional tachometer that you might see on the everyday car. So. I've got this working. I feel like this is pretty cool. There's some other tweaks that I could do. I could adjust the patterning of my chaplets. I could play with some of those nuances. But in general, I think this feels pretty good. Now, the other cool thing about the way that I'm building this with spline wrap is if I was to decide that maybe a radial tachometer isn't the appropriate take, maybe I want something that's more of like a bar graph or sometimes they will refer to this as a like a hockey puck uh, or a, a hockey stick formation where you have a tachometer uh, common in like race cars rather than a radial tack they'll have this this shape that's like kind of like a bar graph but it almost mimics the shape of the the power or the torque curve and so i'm creating a different spline and all i have to do is go into spline wrap and say you know what follow this spline instead and my chaplets immediately follow along that, and I can have a completely different kind of tachometer design. Uh, pretty cool. I think that's that's fun, but I think I'm going to stick with the radial one. The radial one, to me, feels appropriately classic and kind of fun. Um, I want to create a needle that goes around my tachometer. But instead of it being a traditional needle, I feel like it should be more like a digital progress bar or something that's just a little more mechanical. So I'm going to work with a plane object here. And I'm going to see if I can just get that to really easily wrap around that same spline. I'm going to take the spline wrap deformer and just place it directly underneath my plane. Again, assign the very same circular spline to it. And you can see it's right now mapping to that same surface, that same space. And I'm even giving it that same kind of banking here. Now it's intersecting. It's looking kind of ugly, a little bit nasty. So what I can do is go in here to the spline wrap bounding box and actually adjust this so that it tucks inwards a little bit more here. So 
Uh, still seems a little wonky. First thing is I need more horizontal segments on my on my wrap here. And then the other thing is I don't want this to go all the way around because it's just sort of getting in the way of things. So I have these great controls of from and to that let you control the starting and end point of whatever it is that I'm wrapping around this spline. So what I'm doing right now is placing this here. I'm gonna put just a basic material on here. We're gonna keep it real simple and just do some, some basic uh, standard renderer sort of stuff. You can of course use all these same techniques in Redshift and go wild with some awesome GI based solutions. But I'm gonna basically use just a bright yellow and then in the alpha channel, I've put this gradient here. And what that means is when I apply this to this plane, you can see I have a, a bright yellow leading edge and then it tapers off almost like a comet trail would. The only thing is for me, I want my tachometer to go uh, clockwise, not counterclockwise. So I'm gonna change the orientation here just by changing the orientation of the plane primitive. And now I actually have this element that I think will function as a cool looking needle on my on my tachometer. Uh, let's throw some color on the chaplets too. I've been loving this sort of like laser red color uh, that's a little bit little bit crazy, gets a little little intense. Um, there's some some fun stuff there. And something that's really nice about this is now that I've set this up with spline wrap and I've set it up with my my two and my from controls here, it's actually really easy for me if I wanted to to animate this revving around just using the offset parameter. I can literally just use this and kind of like, you know, imagine a car revving its engine, vroom, vroom, you know, can just do that, throw some keyframes, and I'm good to go. So uh, pretty happy with the simple forms of how this is coming together. But there's more than just a tachometer that I want to put together for, you know, this relatively big open space that I have here in my Porsche interior. So there's a few other elements that I'd like to start building out and putting together. So let me pull open right here. Let's see. I think when I'm thinking of cars, I always like instrumentation that shows off interesting functions or features of those vehicles. And so in many cars, I find it very gratifying to see like a visualization of the vehicle itself with some interesting graphics surrounding it that can speak to how the vehicle functions and operates. So uh, one of the coolest functions in a modern day sports car is the concept of torque vectoring, which is when each different wheel is able, able to deliver power uh, at different percentage levels based on how the vehicle is performing, how it's sticking to the ground, and how it's feeling about uh, its, its adhesion, its traction to the surface around it. So I'm going to set up yet another spline wrap sort of scheme. And once again, I'm going to use a plane. I'm going to drop in the spline wrap deformer, put that as the child to his plane. I'm going to assign it to this circle. Uh, I need to adjust the rotation of it so that it gets the approximate kind of banking that I'm looking for, which is gonna be 90 degrees. And now I'm gonna go into my spline, add the right number of segments. I'm gonna adjust the height. I'm gonna grab the circular spline itself and reorient it so that it's about like this. And what I wanna do is create a circular, almost like force field around my Porsche that's here, and then play with the height of this force field to almost imply that it is detecting which corner of the car, which of the four wheels is getting the most power delivered to it. And so to create that in the style of like a, a proper data visualization, I'm thinking it would be cool for there to be like almost like a waveform like feeling that surrounds the car. I'm gonna put another one of these gradient uh, alpha textures like this. Uh, very, very simple thing, but already feels like pleasing and interesting, right? Feels like it has this cool luminescent ring that's surrounding it. 
But what I want to do is have the height of the ring respond to where the car is making the most power. And so there's a really cool function within spline wrap, which is that you have control over the size of the element, right? I can kind of scale it up or down vertically, but I can also do that via a graph. And so what I'm going to do is play around with this line chart. And as I add new points to it, you're going to see I can actually go in and control how tall different areas of this element is. So as I'm pulling down on this graph, you can actually see based on the sort of like percentage of degrees around this circle, how much this is sort of like rising or sagging. I'm going to actually amplify the size of this in general just to enhance that. I'm going to come down here and make my lowest point, maybe not as low, bring that up a little bit more and play with this and say, all right, let's try and say that the right rear wheel has the most power and I want it to feel like it's almost like spiking up there. See those flat edges right there? I need a few more segments in my plane that's wrapping around and I might even, it might even help to bring down uh, or add some more segments to the spline itself. And so going in here, playing with this graph, it makes it really easy to create these almost like ripples that are happening along this ring and get some cool effects. And I just have to kind of do a little trial and error and play with how they're positioned and where they're landing to get some interesting effects and say like, oh, okay, maybe I put a little lump in here. Maybe I do this. And all of a sudden we've got kind of a cool, funky looking visualization here that to me has a little more interest than what you would find in any other car, which would just be like four bar graphs uh, telling you how each individual wheel is performing. Instead, we've got this more organic, almost like waveform-like element that helps to bring this visualization to life. So feeling pretty good about this one and how it's coming together. Um, one other piece that I always like to see when I'm thinking of cool sports car interior is going to be a racetrack. And uh, some performance cars will on occasion present to the driver uh, the opportunity to bring up the map of whatever racetrack it is that you're visiting. Here I've got a spline that I made really quickly in Illustrator tracing the track map for Watkins Glen International, uh, the greatest racetrack here in uh, New York State, uh, out in western New York. It's amazing legendary racetrack. We're going to do the same exact principles that I had just walked through, and I'm going to kind of speed through this one uh, because you're going to notice a lot of the same things that we had discussed previously are going to be at work here. So first thing to do is play around with just having some basic uh, shapes. I want to have like using like a cube structure to create a track. All right. The track now has some volume, has some geometry to it. When you go in here, check this out. I use that same height uh, map so that this is no longer a traditional 2D track map, but is actually showing the elevation changes. That is the coolest thing about Watkins Glen is when you come around this corner, you do this insane downhill swing into a hairpin turn. And being able to see that height easily adjusted here using these spline wrap parameters uh, makes it super easy to put together something a little more dynamic. So I duplicated this cube through my sort of laser red color on top of it to get something that would feel a little more uh, intense for the top surface level here. And then I use some of those gradient planes that I love to put together some uh, something that could kind of like represent almost a driver's position on this track. So again, Using one of these planes, this was just, you know, was previously just a normal plane, threw that gradient on it, and then I apply that same spline wrap. And as you can imagine, again, all I have to do is just go in here into the offset parameter and like, boom, I can see this sort of like presence 
of a green driver making their way around the racetrack. And I love the way it looks, particularly when it like wraps around the bends and the corners. Uh, some, some fun stuff here. So really easy to put together these different kinds of visualizations. Now, the key is going to be taking all of these different disparate visualizations and bringing them together into the interior of the vehicle. And so I'd gone in and made some extra little embellishments and, and put together a few of these different concepts here, each and every one of them, of course, leveraging the spline wrap tools that I've been describing. So we have over here our torque vectoring widget, uh, which is looking, looking rad and has those waves moving through it. We have our main instrument cluster, which I had augmented not only with the main tachometer and that leading edge progress bar, but added these two sort of uh, radial elements just going in a different axis. To me, that just makes the composition feel a little more dynamic to drop this sort of like price is right wheel in here. And I've got all these pieces coming together here in my vehicle interior. Uh, also made a sort of like floor plane. I wanted there to be a consistent surface for things to kind of like reflect off of and feel grounded. And as you can tell, looking at this floor, sure enough, uh, made a spline that was that shape, ran it through the spline wrap again, and got a great sort of like structural foundational element to tie all of these pieces together. So I'm ready to render this. Let's see what we can do to uh, spit this out into, we're gonna fire a nice little render out onto the desktop. Um, let's make sure I've got an alpha channel set up there. I'm going to make sure my background isn't visible. That's correct. Um, also really easy thing to do when setting up my camera in the scene. This is just a photo I pulled off of Unsplash. I used this camera calibrator tool, which made it ridiculously easy just to like drag, uh, basically do like a corner pin exercise to find anything in the scene that was rectangular and use that to like automatically estimate where my camera should be positioned. Worked like an absolute charm, made my life super easy and made it really easy to quickly put together these visualizations. Again, for me, like this isn't the beginning of a TV commercial. This for me is like, I'm sketching, I'm exploring, I'm tinkering around. I wanna show my clients what's possible with these ideas and these opportunities that, that they have presented and how we can best take advantage of them. So I've got my key render set up. We're gonna bring this over here into After Effects and we're gonna drop this into this Porsche interior. This isn't quite working just yet because it has all this inherent depth that goes a little bit beyond the core space of the actual like area that the car has naturally for a display. So I'm gonna make just a really quick and dirty garbage mat. This won't look perfect, but it'll help us get the idea across and help us more than anything strike a mood. Uh, I can't reinforce enough. When you're working on any of these projects, whoever your clients are, you have to make sure that you're in the early parts of the process, never prioritizing fidelity over just you know concept and the notion of the ideas that you're working on coming up with and how they can be constructed in ways that will be really dynamic. Um, I had cut out this steering wheel to put on top and I'm just gonna cut out the inside of it real quick with another garbage mat. And that should make a little more space for my screen. And so now that mat is visible and what we will do is effectively say, hey, we're gonna use that garbage mat as a track mat to make this all work. So this is feeling pretty cool to me. I'm gonna duplicate my mat and put it behind here. Let's make that mat totally black. Um, but this is far from complete. This would benefit from a little bit of compositing love. So what I'm going to do is pre-comp this dash display. I'm gonna go into this pre-comp. I'm gonna paste the interior in here just so I have it for reference, but I'm going to set this to be a guide layer. Uh, there we go. 
which means that it won't come through in here. And so this whole layout is going to benefit quite a bit from some cool effects and post-processing. So for me, that means let's start getting into some adjustment layers. And I'm going to get into the Red Giant suite of tools to start finding some cool opportunities. Red Giant makes a number of different really cool glows. And when I'm working with something like this, it always benefits from a glow, immediately makes it feel a little more dramatic. I'm going to turn the intensity down on it just a little bit. And then uh, old trick that old school guys like myself like to do, you duplicate your glow, you crank up the size of it to make it extra diffuse, but you dial back the intensity and you get like a slightly more detailed fall off. Let's see, before and after, you know what, that second glow may be a little too trashy, a little too much. Let's turn that off for, for right now. Um, I'm also gonna bring my matte element also into this pre-comp, uh, just so I have that for reference. And let's also set that to be a guide layer. A uh, few other things that we can do in here to make this a little more dynamic and interesting. Uh, anywhere, any, anyone that's ever worked with me uh, knows that I am pretty, I'm a pretty simple guy. I'm a pretty one note dude. You saw I did like everything using this one spline wrap tool. If there's one other thing that I lean on way too much, it is lens flares. And within the Red Giant suite, you have the awesome uh, No Light Factory tool which can create all different kinds of lens flares. Got to be really careful when you're using lens flares, though. You don't want to just be like, oh, okay, there's like a Tinkerbell flying through the scene. You want to find like a luminescent area of interest that could be a light source. And I'm going to place this on top of that yellow area, and I'm actually going to make the lens flare pretty small. I'm going to make it relatively small set. It's just a little highlight kick. We can add some color to it to match that yellow that was in that element. And I'm even gonna bump the blending mode from screen up to add, which will add just a little extra heat. And so little touches like that, sometimes I'll go through and I will make numerous instances in a scene of small lens flares, more than anything, just to help make it feel as though like the level of luminance and lighting within the display is a little bit inconsistent. That can make things feel a little more natural, a little more uh, dramatic and, and fun. So drop a couple, couple extra lens flares in here. Um, that's feeling pretty cool. I'm pretty, pretty happy with how that is coming together. Um, let's do something else that's cool with a lens flare. Um, I'm gonna duplicate my lens flare layer let me make it so that I've got only one instance of no light factory. We're going to bring the scale right back up. And you know what? Let's actually do this. We're going to cut this guy out of here. We're going to make a whole new comp. And I'm going to go into my comp settings. I'm going to make this comp completely square because I have a plan. Uh, we're going to... Put a black solid in here. Oh, whoops, that did not make a square comp because my aspect ratio was locked. So let me uncheck that, 1920 by 1920. We now have a square composition. I'm gonna put a black background in here. I'm gonna drop in another instance of Light Factory. And let's see what we've got for other lens flare options. Ooh, this one's pretty cool. That looks pretty, pretty wild. Uh, I wanna do something that feels a little different, a little unique, and a little distinct. I've got a bunch of radial elements in my scene. And so what I wanna do is have one of these streaky anamorphic lens flares, but have it be at the same time somehow circular. So I'm going to go in here to distort and I am going to use, what do I wanna use? I wanna use polar coordinates. And polar coordinates, when I set this from rectilinear to polar and I, turn up the interpolation, it's going to take my scene and make it effectively wrapped into a circle. And now I have this lens flare element that I can play with the position of it and see where it falls on screen. And to me, this is a really interesting effect. It feels now less like a lens flare and more like almost like a sunrise over a planet or, or something fascinating along those lines. So 
Uh, I've got that busted out as a pre-comp. Let's take that in here. And I'm going to, for right now, I'm just going to corner pin it. If I had, if I was spending a little more time with this, I'd probably import my Cinema 4D camera into After Effects, which would allow me to do a great job of really easily placing it alongside some of my elements. But for right now, I'm just going to kind of corner pin it over here uh, in the general vicinity of my radial tachometer just to be another element that adds just a little bit extra emphasis to this uh, this space. Now, I'm going to go in here into the pre-comp, and I'm going to... Actually, let's come back out here. What's going to happen if I rotate this? Is it going to get... Yeah, it's going to get a little bit jacked up. So I'm going to go in here. I'm going to play with my flare position to get it to come a little more up into this zone. And now, to me, that feels that feels pretty cool. I could still finesse my corner pinning just a little more, maybe, to get this into, like, a slightly more realistic space. But I like just having this, like, echoing light sweep. That almost feels like it's, like, jumping out of the instrument cluster. All right. Uh, I got one extra trick up my sleeve that will add a surprisingly large amount of volume to what's been a pretty simple composition so far. Uh, the The guys at Red Giant introduced me to this awesome effect that is within their group of glow effects called point zoom. And what this does, whoa, look at that. Uh, that is that is way too much. But what point zoom does is it allows me to place a sort of like origin point. Think of it almost like a projector beam that is shining forward into all of these elements. So I'm going to turn off that, there we go. Look at that. Look at how much, like, immediately that adds so much volume and even enhances, like, the sensation of, like, speed and momentum that is really important for this content that I'm creating here. So uh, just to make sure that everything comps through properly, I'm going to put a black solid back behind everything. And I'm going to look at this now within the interior of the car. That's feeling pretty good to me. Now... The comp is still a little wonky. I'm going to do some quick and dirty shortcuts, like just doing like an overly aggressive vignette on everything to make us a little less distracted by like what we can see coming out through the windshield of the car. Um, I think this would benefit from maybe a little dash of magic bullet, which is like the perfect way of instantly getting a really rich and complex color correction pass on whatever it is that you are creating. When you do this on top of all of your pieces, uh, my, my buddy Mike Schaefer used to always describe it as like, oh, it like when you do this properly, this like seals in the juices. It kind of like blends everything together just a little bit and lets these different artifacts or different qualities of the, the image and how it's presented almost like leak into each other. And it automatically like makes your composition feel a little more convincing. Um, I'm going to go for, I don't know, let's try, let's try this cutting board look. I like how like, weirdly desaturated and with all these like laser reds that are coming through i'm starting to get kind of like a almost like an 80s vibe from this which to me means that it's time to add another lens flare on top of this uh let's see here let's get in here and see what do we have for natural light that sounds almost too tasteful uh, there we go. That's pretty trashy looking. Uh, that's wild. Uh, this guy. Okay. So we're not going to put this right in the middle of the scene, but like almost as like an out of frame light source. And when you see that coming in and with like the chromatic coloring in there, now it looks like someone's been smoking cigarettes inside this car. And that's the look I'm going for here. Uh, I'm going to add a little bit of a red tint to that. Maybe not too much, just a little bit. Um, and sometimes I can get away with this. I'm going to take this whole 
element and see what happens if actually I'm, I'm nervous as to how this is going to go. So I'm going to actually duplicate this. I'm going to go to the whole pre-comp that had all of those elements in there, and I'm just going to swing the colors. I'm going to do a hard colorization to like fully saturated red. I'll sometimes even bring the the brightness of it down a little bit so that like my most luminescent colors in here are red and to me that does start to play into some of that 80s vibe maybe i'll mix that in with the original just a little bit but that's feeling pretty good to me now the only other thing that gets me is that the car interior in general is feeling too like normal without a little bit of like red on it so let's do Let's just do another pass at that sort of like reddening. Um, crank the saturation way up. Let's bring the lightness up. Let's switch this to an overlay mode. This is not real color correction. This is like very sloppy way of doing it, but it's gonna work. It's gonna get the general idea across for us. I'm, I'm pretty confident it will. At least I, geez, I hope it will. Um, all right, so let's make this a subtractive mat with a little bit of feathering on it let's mix this back a little bit and now we've got like just a little bit of red coming into the interior and i think i'm feeling pretty good about this i'm gonna throw like sometimes i just need one extra little bit of punching up the the levels or the brightness um sometimes even in selective areas this is another like really dirty and cheap way of doing things where I'll, I'll throw some strong levels on stuff, but I'll just kind of isolate it uh, softly with garbage mats to a few different areas just to, again, make it certain that when, when your audience looks at this image, you want them to, without hesitation, immediately know like where their eyes should go within the image. And you don't want there to, them to be like struggling to figure out which different things they should be looking at or paying attention to, it should be obvious at a glance. So, all right, pretty quick and dirty, but to me, I think this gets us to a point where for some really quick iterating and like way too much spline wrap and lens flares, we've got something that is a pretty compelling proof of concept just to show up in front of a client and say, hey, have we thought about looking at a way that we could leverage augmented reality within the interior of a vehicle so that your instruments and your visualizations aren't flat on an iPad surface, but feel like they are living in a deep, infinite space that surrounds you. So I hope this gives you a little bit of a sense as to how I love to leverage these tools in, in my process and also give you just a little bit of a sense as to the way that I'm thinking about and approaching these these projects and these opportunities. I, I can't say enough how much I love this industry and this space and this discipline. And I, I encourage everybody to really look at the ways that you can take these skills, these tools that you have at your disposal and find new and unexpected ways to leverage them because again, everyone out there, especially as emerging technology catches us more and more off guard, are going to be counting on creative, clever, and flexible and adaptive folks like all of you to bring these ideas to life. Thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy your time at NAB. Great job. John Lepore, everyone. Kit says hello. That's, oh, uh, wonderful. That, yeah, Kit. So uh, for those of you who don't know, Watch Knight Rider. You can find it. Uh, there was no question. Somebody said um, you're living in 2777, apparently. All right. So you're ahead of your time. Oh, it was Dave from yesterday, Weinstock. All right. So uh, stay tuned. We're going to have our next presenter up in just about five minutes. So for those of you who are looking to switch gears, huh? look at that. Switch gears. Oh, huh? nicely played. Switch gears over into the world of medical and uh, medical illustration mm. animation. Stay tuned. Ingrid will be up next. So thanks again, John. Thank you.